Hey everybody, welcome back. Um, I can't promise anything today except that this interview is going to be awesome. So please share it with people who need to hear it. The author is Dr. Paul Kengor. The book is The Devil and Karl Marx. Dr. Kengor, welcome back. How are you? Uh, thank you, TJ. Good to be back. And once again, as we did with the politically incorrect guide to communism, such a warm and fuzzy and lovely topic. You are, yeah, no kidding. You are, uh, you're probably not going to believe this. It's going to sound like I'm just blowing smoke at you. But after we did our interview, and yours is one of the favorite ones I've ever done, uh, not just because the book was terrific and well-researched, but it, uh, it, there was so much in there that I didn't know. I started thinking about my public education and how if you go to college, there's not really any courses on how Marxism is destroying the world or how Marxist people are miserable no. like their founder. And, and all these ideas that come out of their use, these people all really have one thing in common. And so I'm going to link to that. I'm actually going to show people the clip of the notes I have here. Go check this out. It's online. I will post a link to it. I have like 30 pages of notes on every single person that was inf affected by Marxism and the kind of things they believed and did. And, uh, and now here we are summing it up and going back to the source. So talk to us about the motivation for writing this book and the super provocative title that you chose, which is terrific. Well, if I could back up to what you said there a minute ago, the, yeah, this is not what kids learn in college. And in fact, instead they learn a very positive view on Marx. In fact, in the course that, that, that I teach at Grove City College, I teach a number of courses, but just yesterday, I was going through Marx and Marxism, and I gave all the kind of popular quotes from the manifesto, but also a lot of other Marx quotes from a lot of other readings, a lot of other writings that people don't know about. And and the students, you could just tell their jaws were on the floor, right? They, they didn't know any of this stuff. And I had a student who came up to me after class, and he said, I want to show you through my phone a picture of the PowerPoint that my girlfriend just took for me of the presentation that she just got on Marxism at her college. It was a different college. And it said things like capitalism, you know, ruthless exploitation, uh, you know, taking people's money, uh, you know, just uh, every kind of caricature you could think of. Socialism, solidarity, right, sharing. <laughs> it was, it, TJ was so unbelievably simplistic. It was a side-by-side -side, uh, PowerPoint, and under capitalism it had, like, three bullet points, each like four words, right? Socialism, each bullet point, each like four words. In, in, in my presentation in class, I had to erase that board so many times. I was writing down so many quotes, and then it was all over. I said to them, uh, yeah, I know you already wrote all that, but I'm going to bring you in four or five handouts on Friday with these exact quotes and citations. So, so th these kids at these universities, they're being lied to. They're being lied to. They're being ripped off. And when they finally leave and they do what you know, people like you and myself and others have done, which is self-educate after having paid $100,000 in, in, in tuition over, over four years, they, uh, they, they, they go and they finally learn truths about people like Karl Marx, um, which, which, as you know, in this book, I talk about his anti-Semitism, talk about his racial views. Really horrible stuff. And I've been through this before with Margaret Sanger, right? I'll write about this stuff for decades. Liberals will read it and they'll say, oh, this, this can't be true. I, I mean, Margaret Sanger is wonderful. I mean, she would have never spoken to the KKK. Uh, you say it's in her memoirs of all things? Oh, that can't be. My professor would have told me that she talked about her KKK speech in her memoirs. Oh, I would have heard about that, right? Say, no, it's right here. You have your screenshot right here pages 366 367 Houghton Mifflin 1938 memoirs Margaret Sanger May 26 19, uh, May, May 1926 May 1926 speech to the Silver Lake New Jersey chapter of the KKK here's all the quotes from Marx and, and with Sanger it's taken a good 10 15 years of this kind of thing to even get progressives to finally start paying attention uh, now with Marx this is all brand new to them right I mean, you have even people like um, Patrice Cullors of uh, Black Lives Matter who calls herself a trained Marxist and people think to themselves, no, the person who runs Black Lives Matter could never call herself a trained Marxist when you see what Marx said about blacks. Truth of the matter is she probably doesn't know what Marx said about blacks because people haven't learned this stuff. So um, I'm sorry, that's a digression from your, from your I, No, it's all, I'm just thinking every day at your job must, I don't know the word to describe it. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, you remember the movie The Island? 
with Ewan McGregor and Scarlett Johansson, where these newborn yeah. children are basically come out and turn into adults in a year or two. That's how I envision your work going. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so there's a lot, it's going to be hard to do this justice in the time that we have here. Right. Uh, so I've got a list of questions and I'm going to post my notes on this one as well as I did the last one. I think people should definitely go check it out. <clears throat> But, uh, but you asked the title, right? The Devil and Karl. Yeah, Marx? the Devil and Karl Marx. So there's, I didn't. You do your research. There's a lot of great footnotes. There's a lot of references to other terrific books written, which I have not read yet, and I intend to. Why did you decide to write this? Why did there's already so many good books out? What made you decide that this is your next project after writing so many books about the topic? Well, I, I just I write too many books. Period. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I, I I really do. I've done probably twenty in about twenty years, and. And it's funny, people, uh, TJ, they'll say, oh, congratulations on your new book. I'm like, I don't want congratulated. It's not why I do this. I mean, if anything, right, this becomes laborious, right, if uh, that's the right word. Um, but, but I did, the first of those books after my published dissertation was called God and Ronald Reagan. And then I did God and George W. Bush. And then I did even God and Hillary Clinton. A lot of conservatives, surprised here I did that, but they're spiritual biographies. And I was asked to do two, three others like that, which I declined at different times because I had other book projects. And so I've always been interested in the kind of spiritual life of, of Karl Marx, especially knowing that he came from this um, religious Jewish family and then becomes um, his, his father was baptized. His father converted to Christianity. Marx was baptized a Christian. Marx became not just an atheist, but a militant, aggressive atheist, who wrote, among other things, his infamous Opiate of the Masses essay, which, which says not just the religion was the opiate of the, of the masses, but, but a religion is the heart of heartless conditions, the soul of a, of a soulless world, the sigh of the oppressed creature. So he wrote, writes in that essay, the criticism of religion is the beginning of all criticism. And this was a guy who talked about the, quote, ruthless criticism of everything that exists, unquote. His favorite line was from Goethe's Faust from the Mephistopheles character. That's the demon devil character who said everything that exists deserves to perish. And, and friends and associates, I quote uh, Karl Heinzen, who described Marx as... Um, uh, eyes like a wet goblin chanting the words of Faust, chanting the words of Faust. So, so if you're going to write a book on a spiritual biography of Karl Marx, it ain't going to be called the. It ain't going to be called God and Karl Marx. <laughs> and, and, and when you and when you see what the man wrote about about the devil in his plays, in his poems, and People using words like um, to describe him like the monster of ten thousand devils. Ingalls said that his father's his best friend. Yeah. yeah, his best friend. His father writing to him in a letter, March second, eighteen thirty, eighteen thirty seven, asking him if his heart was quote governed by a demon, and if so, is that demon Faustian? As, as he put. So when you see all of this, this composite on Karl Marx. Uh, the, the title begs to be called, and again, you know, the devil and Karl Marx, that's kind of a common phrase, right? The devil and, right? the devil and Daniel Webster. You go in and just Google the word, the devil and, you got a bunch of other stuff that pops up. So it's, but it, in, in this case, it fits. And I'm not saying, I'm probably anticipating your next question here. Um, I'm reading people online who are saying, you should read Paul Kengor's new books, book he says Karl Marx was a Satanist. No, I, I, I don't say that. I, I, I quote other people who do. I quote uh, other people, including his uh, great biographer, Robert Payne, who was no right winger, very kind of thoughtful British professor of arts and literature, and wrote at least two great biographies of Marx, Simon & Schuster, New York University Press, 1968 was the one he did that was... The biography of Marx went through a lot of his plays and poems. He has a chapter on Marx called called The Demons. And he even says, Payne does, that it seemed at times as if Marx was possessed by demons. He had the devil's malignity, the devil's view of the world, and, he, and it seemed as if he knew or, or seemed to believe that at times he was doing the work of the devil. It's almost a verbatim quote. 
what's your key words there, but it's, it's in my book. So I say, look, I mean, I, you know, I don't know if a guy, I was possessed. I mean, I'm not going to go that far, right? But, but yeah, I, I present this whole composite, his troubling writings. I say, really, the book would probably be better called The Devil and Communism because stuff on Marx is only about a fourth of the book. But the, uh, yeah, I mean, you, TJ, you need an exorcist to tell me if the guy was possessed. Well, right? and that's, you asked if I was going to ask that question. Maybe you've gotten a lot, but I wasn't because I've read. Oh, so it, the audiobook's about 19 hours long. I usually do audio, audible if I can, even though I have the book here. I'm about oh. 11 hours in right now. And we've kind of gotten away from Marx, the man, and his theories on spirituality to the effects of those beliefs on everyone else who was affected by them. So I think my question is, and you talked about Heinrich. Heinrich has some devastating letters to his son, some really troubling yeah. things. And one of the quotes that stands out is when he said that you seem to be, and we all know the quote, I think it was his wife or mother, it was his mother who said, you should spend more time acquiring capital than writing about it. But his father <laughs> said, you seem to be completely incapable of giving joy to anyone around you, including yourself or something along those lines. You're just a yeah. person who seems incapable of making yeah. anyone happy. And you start looking for consistency patterns and trends amongst people who believe those ideas are worth having and you see the same pattern in all of them. And so my question is, you go through all these different biographies that I'm sure you scoured and the hey geographies about Marx and the really bad stuff, they kind of gloss it over and go, well, if you're a college student, you have to understand the context and the things that he really meant and why we can excuse this terrible behavior instead of hitting it head on and saying, this is a guy who had major issues. This is a guy who hated, hated almost every single person he was close to his entire life. His entire, his life was based around criticizing everything except for himself. And the light bulbs start to kind of go on one by one and go, I see this today with miserable people who are specialized in making others miserable while preaching that they're doing it for good reasons. And so the first quarter of the book, that's kind of what I took from it. But I want you to kind of talk about some of these things. Uh, we could talk about family. We could talk about the fact that he Can raped. I add to that one made, point? Please take it away. Yeah. So the, uh, yeah, one of the Marx biographers in recounting the letter between him and his father um, has this kind of, oh, how touching, right? It's not touching. It's frightening. It's, it's scary. I mean, the old man is enraged. I mean, you can picture the old man quite literally falling over from a heart attack after finishing that letter. Which was a month that, or two after the letter was sent, right? I mean, he literally died. Precisely. Right after. Precisely. That, in his 50s. And, and the account from... From Heinzen about you know Marx, you know eyes of a wet goblin and everything. One of the Marx um, hagiographers is, is like, oh, ha, 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 this is funny, you know, this is playful, right? Rambunctious and, and, and or something think, like that, yeah. Yeah, and you just you look at this, you, it's one of those things where you say in life, you know, this is this is how how badly partisanships and po politics just infects and poisons the mind's ability to think. Where Two people could look at something and one's like, well, man, that's satanic. And the other's like, oh, how cute. <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, I, I'm actually I try to be somewhere in between where, where, where I say, well, I can't say this is Satanist. Right. I mean, it may be. Right. Um, but playful. Oh, come on, man. You're really excusing your guy here. You don't find anything troubling about this. Well, so so so, yeah, that is. Um, yeah, and, and I was going to say something else about that, too, but I think I, f I forgot. Well, anyway, it, go ahead. It's going to be a huge surprise to people out there that college students, you've, you've been on the cancellation list for some of the things that you believe and teach. So I would just want to hit specifics. And in terms of, and I've got a huge list here, which I know we're going to get to, but you've got, I left a comment the other day where someone's like, oh, well, Paul Kengor, of course he feels that way. He's a hateful Christian, you know, whack job. And I thought, you've got this guy who everyone in his immediate vicinity, including his wife, who said she longs for the comfort of the grave while she's married to him, right. figured out that this person was a colossal loser and a spiritual anchor on everyone. And then you've got these people 100 years hence, after the blueprint of the 20th century, who defend the ideas still. And my one of my slogans is, the worst ideas need the best advocates. And that's what I see when I read this. So in terms of a couple examples, um, let's talk about his, he commented that there should be no inheritance. You can tell me how he actually lived his life. Commented about, um, wrote about being a 
advocate for the proletariat, and then he had a maid who he didn't pay and raped and took property that didn't belong to him. He talked about the abolition of family and the abolition of private property. Talk about his specific writings and how these things are interpreted today as being idealistic as opposed to what they were then, which was a tornado on steroids. Well, and he had two daughters who committed suicide in suicide packs with their husbands. I mean, I just... I mean, that's it. Case closed. Uh, how often does that happen? Hold on. Right? Time out. Time. Didn't one of them, I think I read in chapter five, didn't one of them back out of the pack and just take the spouse's money? Yeah. Yeah. And in one of the two suicide packs, the the husband at the end backed out after um, agreeing to a suicide pact with Marx's daughter, feeding her the poison and then backing out and taking the money. And, and in fact, um, you know, Marxists all believed and, and the friends of the family all believed that this guy, Edward Aveling, who was a scoundrel. And by the way, who just like Marx um, was a womanizer, somebody who wouldn't work for a living and uh, got all of his money from from others. Uh, but some people felt that Aveling should have been tried for homicide, for right. murder. But 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 both daughters entered into suicide packs with their husbands and two of the daughters consummated the deal. They actually killed themselves. And in Marx's poems and plays, he actually writes about suicide acts, including you know, women taking su- uh, you know, dying by taking, by taking poison. So, yeah, this guy's personal life was an absolute wreck. And he even told Ingalls, he said, my poor wife, there's not a day that doesn't go by that she doesn't wish that she were firmly in her grave with the children. And some of the children, probably at least one of them, Arguably, you know, I'm choosing my words carefully. I'm trying sure. to be fair. Sure. Uh, but you know, uh, arguably, probably died from from the kind of poor living conditions, um, maybe exposure to the elements that uh, that Marx was responsible for. Was it intestinal Marx tuberculosis? Was intestinal was it tuberculosis or something like that? Yeah, Some something like that. They, yeah, I think a lot of these diagnoses from from long ago aren't aren't reliable. And but 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 so, yeah, so, something to that effect. Marx himself was plagued by boils and carbuncles, which it's funny. I was reading some of the accounts of that. I, I was I was pre med. I spent four years working for a hospital, and it's it's funny, TJ. The doctors are trying to figure out. I just can't understand why he has these boils, and uh, no one else in the family seems to have them. Uh, well, maybe because the guy won't bathe, the guy won't take a bath, right? I mean, let's see you not bathe for a year. And if you start getting pimples on, on, on yourself, I, I, that and I, he practice. wrote about his own carbuncles, like on his face and how he'd been cursed to have right. that. And I saw I Google carbuncles on a face. I'm like, that is revolting. It's disgusting. He, he's, he's, he told Ingalls, the devil is throwing um, excrement in my head. The devil is hurling excrement at, at my head. But yeah, and the, and the people who... Um, who want to dismiss me as a whack job and everything. I got a couple. I had a review in in National Review. It was very negative. And he said, this book is not going to persuade people who are Marxists. And on the left, look, these people aren't even going to pick it up. All right. And and I think the only one star review I have on Amazon is from somebody who clearly didn't read it. I read it. And how's this, TJ? Accuses me of prejudice, right? You know, prejudice against Marx, that is. When the irony is, if he would just open the book and he'd read it, he'd see that Marx was full of prejudices. Well, let's and, talk about that. I'm going to I'm gonna switch yeah. gears. So the other wife that was in a suicide pact, so Marx didn't feel like any men were worthy of his daughters. But what was it like growing up as a daughter of the champion of women, the pro-feminist Karl Marx? And tell us about the one husband who he didn't care for very much. Who loved his wife so much he agreed to kill himself for her. Yeah, that and that son-in-law was named Paul the Farg. The gorilla, who was right? Part, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he was partly Cuban, so in Marx's view, that meant he had some Negro blood. And and be in fact, there's I, I quote a, a letter exchange between Marx and Engels where they're trying to deduce with their scientific Darwinian accuracy how much quote unquote N-word blood. Paul had in him, one eighth, one twelfth, uh, wondering which group of Negro tribesmen that he came from. This is his language; it's not mine. Sure. Uh, 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 Ingalls writing a letter to Paul's wife, which is which is Marx's daughter, 
because Paul was running for office as a political candidate in a Paris district that contained a zoo. And Engels said, ah, well, that should be a perfect job for him, being in his reality as that of a N-word that is one degree closer to to apes or the animal kingdom and the rest of us, he'd be really well suited for that position. <laughs> you know, he and Marx could have a good good laugh about that. They're analyzing his cranial size and everything. And, and, and he, he's not the only one, right? A, a, another um, a German socialist that I, that I quote, uh, LaSalle, and they're, he's trying to figure out, they called him the, um, um, what's the word? Again, N-word, um, Kike, I think, greasy Jew. This guy was part Jewish. N word, K word, J word, they, like just it's alphabet soup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they they be, they believe part black and part Jewish, which meant that they really unloaded on him, right? Because they had two really bad things against him in, in Marx's view. So, and but, this wasn't a secret. Was, I mean, think of, there's a lot of fathers with kids that listen to my show. Think about talking about your son-in-law this way out in the open. This wasn't something he kept from him. He was. Right. Completely contempt of uh, he had contempt for him. Yeah, he called he called Paul the gorilla, or Negrillo, and in one of the letters where he talks about that, I quote, where Marx says, you know, only an idiot would get married. I don't know why anybody would would get married, and uh, talking about how bad marriage is, that that letter is actually to Paul, and so you can see here that he doesn't want Paul to get to get to get married to his daughter, and he also wrote to Ingalls, "Blessed is he who has no family." which is, you know, kind of a curious take on the Beatitudes there. And I read another Marx biographer who was like, ha, 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 a joke by Marx, right? Which, again, you don't know that he's joking about that. And if you read the totality of what he wrote there, he's probably not joking about it. And it was probably That's a direct probably, quote from his wife, let's be honest. More yeah, probably more accurately reflective of what he believed. I know you can't see it. I actually have a copy of Takedown, which I picked up a couple weeks ago, which I'm planning on reading because of how much that Marx and Engels wrote about marriage. And I want to switch gears yeah. a little bit here and talk about that topic. And it's interesting. You also, um, so I'm not Catholic, but I really, really like that I can tell you're a faithful, uh, steeped in knowledge Catholic, and you give your perspective on not only yours, but on other Catholic efforts and Catholic thinkers' efforts to stamp this thinking out. And one of them was, I got some notes here, uh, in talking about marriage, and I posted a little snippet of this actually on my YouTube page to kind of whet people's appetite for this interview, the way that Marx and Engels felt about marriage. Now, Marx was married, and he wasn't very good at it. Engels was not, and Engels had a lot of things he said about marriage, and you make the argument that for someone seeking to have sexual access to the most women possible, like Engels did, this is a pretty good strategy. How is this manifested in terms of Marx's thought today? Take us through that down that yeah. road. Yeah, that's in my book, Takedown, and boy, I continue, TJ, to get really hammered for that. The left has done a magnificent job of boiling down all 300 pages into a sentence, right? <laughs> He blames communists for for gay marriage. <laughs> that's, that's just amazing how uh, it is, including from from from, from uh, liberal academics who are supposed to be scholars, right? They're supposed to be more thoughtful. But but the point of that book is that the attack on family and marriage has been going on um, full throttle for at least two hundred years. And, as I say, obviously, Marx and Engels weren't thinking about same-sex marriage. I mean, nobody, you know, young people, nobody was thinking about that until about the last 10 or 20 years. The entirety of the Democratic Party, almost, I think like 88 percent of the Senate, 88, 80 to 12, something like that, supported the Defense of Marriage Act. And you know, 20 years ago, well, we're at what, mid-1990s, um, defining marriage as between one man and one woman. Uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton. That was their position. It was Barack Obama's position right. uh, be, be, before he became president. So, uh, but Marx and Engels wrote about, this is actually in the Communist Manifesto. This is verbatim. Abolition of the family, exclamation mark. Even the most radical flare up at this infamous proposal of the communists. So, you know, they've been going after marriage and family for a really long time. And Engels, um, Engels and Marx wrote a book on this. It's actually published posthumously after the death of Marx. It was called Origins of the Family. Uh, although Ingalls even says, you know, this is hundreds of pages of Marx's notes. I mean, if Marx was alive, this is a book he would, he would have co-authored. Sure. And, and Ingalls personally was um, so against marriage that he refused to marry. He refused to marry any of these 
poor girls who um, wanted him to make honest women out of them. That's how it was seen back then, right? I mean, you know, people didn't live together outside of marriage back then. You know, that was very, very rare. Uh, but Ingalls refused to marry them. And, and Ingalls didn't care about his reputation. In fact, when Marx got the family nursemaid, Lenchen, pregnant behind his wife's back, and the, he didn't pay the family nursemaid a penny. And then when the child was born, they named him Freddie after Friedrich Ingalls. And Ingalls accepted responsib a responsibility, including, of course, financial responsibility, because Ingalls subsidized Marx and his family all along. And Ingalls did that to help save Marx's marriage. So he accepted paternity for Freddie. Mark refused to ever acknowledge that the, Marx refused to ever acknowledge that the child was his, refused right. to ever any of child support. Yeah. And you know, that's the kind of uh, family man that, that Marx was. And when I talk about this in print Q&As, even at, at friendly conservative websites, I'm surprised that I'm seeing people go there. I, maybe some are concerned. Maybe they aren't. And they'll say, why is this relevant? It, it's come on. Are you that? Are you that dense? I have I have I have theories about that with um, and I got in an argument on social media the other day about there's this really obnoxious guy that got went to I don't know if you remember TPUSA was getting heckled at their own events for a while and they stopped taking right. questions right. and one guy asked Rob Smith you know what's conservative about gay marriage and they kind of laughed it off and shut it down but in my opinion there is a reckoning between the differences of libertarian and conservative ideology and we all assume it's conservative but conservative means certain things and eventually there will be a split there. So I think it's contributed to that, especially if you're young and you look yeah. at TPUSA and the values they espouse. Eventually, there is no overlap there. There's well, just, there's conservatives are supposed to, I mean, conservatism at its very essence, Russell Kirk's definition, it's about conserving and preserving what are considered you know, timeless truths based on um, moral absolutes, basically biblical and natural law. So um, you wouldn't expect a conservative to redefine marriage. And, you know, people who are listening, I, I say this with no hostility. Sure. Uh, you know, th th this is why, um, you, you know, for me, especially as a Roman Catholic, um, so you don't discriminate and mistreat somebody who has same-sex attraction or considers themselves homosexual or gay or whatever the language is, LGBTQ. Um, you, don't, you, you treat them all with sanctity and dignity made in the image of God, the, Oma, the Imago Dei. But, but there's no reason to expect that everybody of every faith should then fall in line with the full aspect of like the LGBTQ political ideological agenda, right? Why must I go against my faith's teachings on marriage, right? It, 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 by the way, it wasn't supposed to be this way. They told us for a long time, right? No, we just want you to, to not mistreat us, right? Um, you don't have to believe in same-sex marriage. It's like, oh, okay, that's the deal. Okay, all right. And it, it, then you get same-sex marriage, and then you, you better accept and approve of same-sex marriage, or you're a bigot and a hater, yeah, actually, it, it, you, you mentioned the quick. you mentioned the people that supported. I interviewed Ryan Anderson from Heritage Foundation when his book came out, and he talked about the Lexus Nexus search of gay marriage. And as soon as Obergefell was passed, he goes, "Then what spiked the next? Like literally the next day, uh, transgender." Uh, it was the next day. It went from not yeah, being a yeah. Google search at all to being all over the media. And so when I read about Mark, it was a media. Yeah. And when you when you think about conservatism, if I had to define it in a slogan, it'd be God, family, liberty. And so if you look at the ideals that Marx held as important, they all undermine all three of those things. And I want to talk more about Absolutely right. Beautifully said. In, yeah. in yeah. terms of in terms of the manifesto. And I think in chapter five earlier, yeah, by book, the way, I'm sorry. Can I, yeah, by all means. Go ahead. Yeah, th there is. And I quote this in the book, Takedown. And again, this is why people, you know, you people who haven't even read the book and want to summarize it in one sentence. This is just so egregious. I quote the July 4th, 1826, July 4th, 1826, 50th anniversary of when Jefferson and Adams died, right? Yeah. That same day, um, uh, Robert, boy, why can't I think of him now? He, uh, Robert Owen. Robert Owen is at his ideological colony in New Harmony, Indiana. He's an American socialist atheist. Actually, he's British. He came to the United States. And, and he and he declares war on what he calls his three-headed hydra of um, of property, marriage, and uh, and God and, and faith, right? And so I mean, this goes back 
at least 200 years. This is my point, right? This battle against marriage and family has long, long roots. And, and people who couldn't conceive of something called same-sex marriage in 1826, my point is that the chipping away at the sanctity of what you know Christians consider um, you know, price, price definition of marriage between one man and one woman. That didn't just start with Obergefell in 2015, right? And it's not, it, it, it goes back 200 years before that. And it's not to say that the commies gave us gay marriage. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but but you, you get from A to Z, all these different things happen along the way that, that help plow the ground to make things possible. That's all. And, 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 and people listening right now and watching and actually trying to understand this will understand it. By the way, you might not like it. That's eh, okay. But, but um, you know, these things require a bit of nuance. We have brains, right? We don't have to just, just sum things up in, in you know, 40 words or 100 or 200 characters or whatever the, the lunacy on Twitter is. We've got this like, like entire Twitter culture of mindset. People think in, in, in sound bites nowadays that people are lazy. People are lazy. I was thinking I got an argument on Twitter with someone about this and I'm, I like to be respectful. I just ask a lot of questions like I, cause I don't harbor hostility towards anyone. I just happen to hey. believe that after this life, there are certain conditions and things that won't exist. And that's when you realize you spent a lot of time spinning wheels when you could have been more productive yeah. and hater. Yeah, it's true. I mean, there, yeah, the, someone's a hater for sure. And someone, okay. uh, but I had the analogy. I said, look, with regard to marriage, I go, the world trade centers got hit in 2011 but they also got bombed in 93. And in 93, they went for the foundation. They tried to weaken the foundation. Once they built up enough strength and courage, they went straight at it. I go, there's a lot of cultural, uh, it's analogous to other cultural wars that we have. And the foundation's been under attack for a really, really long time. And you see that when you read about Marx, not only in what he wrote, yeah. but in how he behaved. I mean, this is a guy who didn't go to his dad's funeral because he was busy after they had their argument. And then his mother, who'd been reluctantly supporting him ever since and finally cut him off, he didn't. I think you said there was a visit where he went to re reconcile after years and, of course, went with his hands out and his hat out. Yeah. And she said no. And she tore up all of his IOUs like in Dumb and Dumber, just ripped them right up. You know, they're not worth more than money. And he came right. back and said, that's the only thing, good thing that came out of that trip is I don't know my mother or anything. That's exactly what he said. That's what he told Laura. Yeah. That's what, or, or Jenny, his wife. Uh, and, and that's precisely right. And that's one of those things, too, where I say in the book. Um, some historians who don't like Marx say he didn't attend his father's funeral out of spite. Others say he wanted to and he couldn't. And I, and I present both sides and I say, I don't know. That's what they say. That's what they say. Good enough. Let's move on. What we do know, Marx said this, was, yeah, he wrote to his wife. He said, you know, basically, at least I got the old bat. I don't think he used the word bat. That's probably my word. But so it's some you know, German, at least German I got to tear bat, up yeah. the IOUs. Yeah. And so if you look at it from the Christian perspective and say, well, he certainly wasn't honoring his father and mother. So whatever the reason was, oh, you know, yeah. it wasn't for good intentions. Um, good so in terms of atheist faith, I know we're running low on time, but this is one of the first bookmarks I made in Audible. I did not know what the original title of the Communist Manifesto was and that oh, Engels yeah. had to talk Marx out of naming it what he wanted to. Tell us about that. That was a revelation. Is, isn't that great? Uh, so the letter from Engels to Marx he refers to it as the Communist Confession of Faith. The Communist Confession of Faith. Booyah. And he says, I think we should ditch the catechetical form and call it just the manifesto, the Communist Manifesto. So think um, Westminster Confession, right, you Calvinists. Think um, uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church, Roman Catholics, right? They use, they use religious language to describe... Now, what the Communist Manifesto actually was, was it was the programmatic statement of the Communist Party. Actually, what was the Communist League at the point, which was all, you know, liberals, you should hate this, old, white, German guys, okay? I think there was one woman in it. It was, it was, it was Marx's, uh, Marx's wife. So the Communist League decided that they needed a statement of what communists believe. So that's, they, they tasked Marx and Engels to come up with it which is why you refer to my Catholicism. In 1846, Pope Pius IX published Qui Pluribus, condemning and exoriating communism two years before the Communist Manifesto was even published. 
And and people say, wow, how, how? Well, it was it was around. It was it was already around. By how long? I'm not sure. We're not quite sure who first came up with or coined the term communism. But some people think it was Marx and Engels in Paris at some point after they first met in the 1840s. But it's interesting that they use that relig- religious language, communist confession of faith. As Ronald Reagan said, uh, you know, Marxism, Leninism, that religion of theirs, right, that religion of theirs, they really do treat it like a religion. You know, for, for guys who claim to be these, these tough, uh, materialist, Darwinian, evolutionist atheists who make fun of you know, religion as the opiate of the masses, oh, you, you religious people. You you need your religion like a drug, right? They 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 would treat their Marxist ideology like a drug, like a pacifier. I mean, it's it's what motivates them. Read if you I don't know if you got to it yet, TJ, but I quote Arthur Kessler, the great ex-communist, and writing in Darkness at Noon, and he describes the complete conversion that uh, that the convert feels when he when he comes into Marxism. And it is, it's like the light comes in from, from every, into every pore of the body. It, 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 he describes it in, in a religious conversion-like term that Saul didn't, didn't describe on the road to Damascus. And you read this stuff, it's like, this is so utopian. You know, these guys, how dare these guys make fun of religion? These these guys are these guys are a form of religious fanatic, you know. They, they might reject Christianity and Judaism, but man, they treat they treat their communist ideology like a faith. Yeah, that's why when it comes to any of those issues we talked about earlier, I don't think they are replacements. I think they're just inferior substitutes, which eerily seem very much like the thing they're replacing. Uh, and you did a couple of things I liked uh, in terms of people who you know don't see value reading the scriptures. You pointed out in the encounter between Christ and Satan, there's a lesson for Marxist. When Satan tried to tempt Christ to misuse his power to create bread, and he said, man does not live by bread alone. And you characterize this as a rejection of materialism. And uh, you had gone on to define that the Greek word utopia actually means no place, a place that doesn't exist and can't be achieved. And that Marx's focus of his entire life and his writings and his efforts was on bread. And here you have Christ telling Satan, there's more to life than bread. And he didn't go on, and like a lot of things in the scriptures, he isn't going to extrapolate meaning and to explain to people. He says, here's the tenant, put it in your life and you'll figure out what I mean by it. And so when I read that, I thought that's a really interesting factor. Like Marxism is about the bread. And then you go on to talk about, I'm only as far as Lenin right now in the Piesch, uh prison torture, which I just posted a snippet about, which is unbelievably oh, yes. evil. And these guys were obsessed with two things, with humiliating religious people and acquiring bread. Extrapolate a little bit on that, and then we'll, then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, yeah, the Potesti prison. Um, progressives, Marxists, liberals watching right now, okay? Um, you probably won't buy the book. You probably won't look at it. I don't care if you buy it. Get it from a library. Just read it. And read the 12 pages on Potesti. And, and, then, and, then, and then walk away from that and, and, and say that you're not convinced that this was evil. Uh, there is no way any human being can read that and not find it utterly repulsive. Black masses, um, staged crucifixions, the um, forcing priests to consecrate human excrement in the communion wafers, dip it in urine and stick it in people's mouths, referring to... Um, Mary as the great whore, um, Christ as the great idiot crucified, and and just the most vile stuff that you can imagine. And Richard Warmbron, the late Richard Warmbron, thought, said that the, the, the worst descriptions in Dante's Inferno are nothing compared to the torture in communist prisons. He said that he had, he had prison guards torturing him, literally yelling, I am the devil, I am the devil. I've waited all my life to ex- for this moment to express all the evil in my heart. Yeah, you know, this is what we're talking. There's no this afterlife. There's no punishment. There's no accountability. Well, exactly, exactly. And what you mentioned there earlier, TJ. Yeah, I mean, Marxists really do act as if man lives by bread alone. Yeah, you know, simply if we could just solve the problem of poverty, if we could simply more equally redistribute wealth, right? If we can just solve the money problem. 
uh, then we can have utopia. I mean, these guys truly do worship a golden cow, right? It, it, but but uh, as Jesus told Satan, man does not live by bread alone. Uh, Augustine said, said, we have a God-shaped vacuum in all of us, and that presumes it's a vacuum only God can fill. Marxists act as if there's a dollar-shaped vacuum in all of us, right? And, and they, uh, in fact, because they end up purging God, the Judeo-Christian God, they end up trying to fill it with the ideology of Marxism, which is utterly unsatisfying because, as Jesus told Satan, right, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by an every word, for, uh, every word from the mouth of God. There is a, uh, oh, and I, I was reading here in my notes that Marx had written, Communism Abolishes Eternal Truths religion and morality. And then you have notes on Lenin referring to religion or belief in God as necrophilia, an ailment yeah. essentially equivalent to a venereal disease. And that gives you some insight on how much they hate people who don't share their faith. Not that a Christian. Hate it. Yeah. Lenin said, all worship of a divinity is a necrophilia. There is nothing more abominable than religion. He said, as Marx said, religion is the opiate of the masses. It is a kind of spiritual booze. Nikolai Bukharin, one of the founding Bolsheviks, founding editor of, of Pravda, said that religion must be taken on at the tip of the bayonet. It, a communism and religion are incompatible. Like Marx said, communism begins where atheism begins. So for anyone listening, a kind of woke religious left Christian who thinks that um, you know, maybe communism has something to teach the Christian faith, you absolutely don't know what you're talking about. Marx and Engels and Lenin and all these guys would have told you you're nuts. So uh, I'm going to encourage everyone to go out and pick up a copy of The Devil and Karl Marx. Maybe get more than one and send it to someone else. It's a tremendous book. I'm not done with it yet. So before I let you go, Dr. Kengor, I'm hoping you can tell me I'm on, uh, I think I'm about 11 hours in. You can either answer one of two questions. What's the one thing you learned from this book that stands out? Or what's something in the second half of the book that's going to kind of knock my socks off a little bit? Oh, wow. By the way, I haven't listened to the audio. I don't think I've listened to the audio version of any of my books, actually. But, uh, but yeah. That's good. We'll, the we'll, guy does voices for different people, which is unusual. He actually mimics Marx and Engels and the Y. Like he, it's kind of fun. He does Lenin very well, in my opinion. Wow. I should, I, I should listen. The, what will really strike you in the second part of the book, it's actually the longest part of the book, part four, is on the infiltration of churches. And specifically in America, and the, the attempted penetration of uh, the mainline denominations, the Roman Catholic Church, and in particular, the success they had with the Episcopal Church and the United Methodist Church. That, and that's based on several major congressional testimonies, uh, eyewitness testimonies by ex-communists, Ben Gitlow, Manning Johnson, Louis Boudin's, Bella Dodd. And uh, even people like William Z. Foster, head of Communist Party USA. So I think that that could be, for a lot of people, even worse than the Marx part, that might be the most alarming thing that they see in the process. It's pretty, pretty sad. Go pick up the book. Uh, are you on social media, Dr. Ken Gore? No, thankfully. <laughs> Smartly. All right. Well, then don't follow him on social media, but definitely... Get uh, some of his ideas in your head so you can let them marinate a little bit and see that he's definitely done his homework, agree with him or not. Thank you for your time and uh, best of luck with this book. I won't congratulate you, but thank you for writing it. <laughs> All right. Very good, TJ. Thank you. God bless. Okay. Say, if you love your kids, if you love your kids, don't let the freak shows get them. What? Don't let the freak shows get them. Please subscribe and share. Please subscribe. Good enough, good enough. Good job, good job. Say bye-bye. 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 Bye. Who are you guys? What are you doing? Say bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye.